we have come together within the strengthening fellowship of friends and family to praise God for the life of Carl Modenbach, to share our grief with God and with one another, reaffirm our faith in God's unfailing goodness. Here again, God's promise of resurrection and to entrust Carl to God's everlasting care. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, your steadfast love endures forever, your faithfulness to all generations. Trustworthy in all your words and gracious in all your deeds, minister now to us in our grief. Speak to our hearts your words of comfort. Touch us into hope through the promises of Holy Scripture. Enfold us within the fellowship of all who share our sorrow. Fill us with the joy and peace that comes from above. In quietness and in peace, we wait upon you. Amen. Jesus Loves the Little Children was a song that was played at Jaylene's service. It brought her and Carl so much comfort during Ricky's life. And after Ricky passed, it was a song that was near and dear to both Jaylene and Carl. So let us hear again the familiar tune. Hi, I'm Joy, and I'm Carl's niece, one of his many, and I wanted to share something that I wrote. Um, I'm going to do this. <laughs> my hero, my uncle, when God made you, he gave you gentleness with a strong spirit. He gave you patience like Job. He gave you a heart to serve others. Through your life, you have modeled a strong work ethic, the importance of putting family first, the value of not worrying and trusting fully in the Lord our God. Your sense of humor brings laughter. The way you make each person you feel, the way you, I can't read, the way you make each person you meet feel like the most special person brings love and compassion to each relationship. 
I am so blessed to have spent so many Christmas seasons with you, celebrated birthdays, shared Thanksgiving and Easter dinner, and the countless other meals and family get-togethers. You always make a point to celebrate accomplishments, graduations, and weddings. I remember sitting in your living room talking about family, going to Bell's, and um, taking motorcycle rides with you. Sometimes my parents didn't know about the motor motorcycle rides until later um, when I was an adult, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> your love for cars was shared with me, and we went to many car shows together. Most of all, I am so blessed to have had you in my life, to be loved by you, and to love you. Your legacy of love, compassion, humbleness, gentleness, generosity, and faith will remain forever. How do you follow and act like that? <laughs> Jeez, I, sh I should have gone first and let her go last. But I want to thank everyone for being here and uh, this show of uh, love and compassion for Carl. I l appreciate all the flowers. Uh, and during the time of the last days of his life, I appreciated the food, which I partook of, um, and the visits, and most especially the prayers over the last few months that. I know that we're lifted up for Carl and for the family. Carl reflected towards the end of his life and how grateful he was to all the people in his life who had uh, supported him and lifted him up throughout his life. And he wished that there was a way that he could say thank you to them. <clears throat> he told me that he was going to make a list of those people. Unfortunately, he didn't, or maybe fortunately, because I have a feeling that list would have been gone on forever. But I especially want to thank Pastor Bill and this church for the welcoming they gave to my brother after Jaylene's death. Um, I, there are also a few other people, and if I don't call your name, um, it's not because of anything other than I just don't have all the names. Um, but... Carl and Jaylene's good friend, Carol, who was with him throughout uh, Jaylene's death and his own death. Um, his next door neighbor, Mary Jane, who endlessly visited Carl and picked up his mail and brought food to him and stuff like that. Uh, there's no way that I can say thank you enough to these people. As well as his good friend, Julia, who he worked with at Bovard uh, and uh, who uh, visited Carl regularly, and her husband, Roger, who took Carl to Moab, something Carl talked about endlessly. As I, actually, I got kind of bored hearing about Moab. <laughs> I mean, you know, and seeing the pictures. But he, he enjoyed that, and that was, that was something that happened that he really appreciated. And, uh, Julie, I'm just glad that you're having to take care of the fiduciary and the things and not me. Um, Carl... Carl was a very kind, caring, loving person who uh, uh, was a good listener because he was truly interested in other people. He learned from other people. And uh, that was something that uh, I think he learned from our dad, who was a good listener also. Um, you know, there's some advantages to being the last surviving member of my nuclear family. And that advantage is I can tell whatever stories about Carl and the family, <laughs> and there is nobody here that can deny it or, or say that's not true. Did you all know that after Carl got out of the Marine Corps, he raced motorcycles professionally for a while? Did anybody know that? Well, because he didn't. It's a lie. <laughs> But, I mean, you know, I can, I can spin yarns like that and nobody can, nobody can refute them. I think I'm going to enjoy that. Um, you know, as I said, uh, uh, Carl was a very kind and compassionate person. And we learned that from our parents. Especially our dad. Carl was not a 
mean person. Now, he had his opinion about things, and if you ever worked with Carl, you knew there was the right way, the wrong way, and the Carl way. <laughs> I was introduced to that as I just spent this past year spending some time with him and doing some cooking. Initially, I think he tried to tell me the way around the kitchen. Carl didn't know the way around the kitchen, and I think pretty quickly he figured out I knew more about that than he did. Uh, but anyway, there's a couple of stories about Carl that just you know, underline his honoriness I want to share. When we were growing up, lived in Oklahoma City for a period of time, and had some next door neighbors that had this kind of space under their house. And he and his friends convinced me and one of my buddies that there was a bear under there and that we couldn't go under. The truth was the matter, they had built a road and stuff under there. Um, and uh, one day they were all gone and my friend and I went under there and discovered there was absolutely no bear under there, so we were free to go under there. The other thing was when Carl was in high school, he and one of his best friends uh, were probably working on his uh, Cushman motor scooter and um, I was, you know, I was about 10, something like that. And being a pest, I mean, you know, what, what can I say? And uh, I think he got tired of me and he said, hey, Rick, I need you to go down to the filling station on the corner and get me some elbow grease. I said, what? He said, yeah, just go down and tell him you want a pound of elbow grease. <laughs> so I hopped on my bicycle and go down there and talk to the guy and he kind of laughed. He said, well, son, what elbow grease is this? When I got back, they were gone. Yeah, yeah what can I say? <laughs> They'd gotten rid of me. Uh, but I could, you know, there are lots of stories about Carl. But uh, one of the things I do want to finish with is that he was a very kind person. And a very good big brother. So I wish him well. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. To my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. Will I 
can only imagine when all I would do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine.
A reading from the book of Psalms, the first one, verses one through three. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither and all they do, they prosper. The psalmist here is articulating what it was like for someone to live in the ways of God, the ways of love, the ways of compassion, and of self-sacrifice. The scripture is a favorite of Carl's, and of course it was a favorite of Carl's, because Carl Modenbach lived his whole life for the sake of others. It wasn't a hobby for Carl to help someone in need or provide care or comfort to someone or to make sure that people were cared for. It was simply the way he lived his life. It's who he was. Do you all know the story of why he enlisted in the Marines? I found that out a couple weeks ago. His sister Anne was married to Al. Al was a World War II vet. Carl actually lived with them for a bit in their garage, I think. But when the Korean War started, Al was recalled to active duty. Carl, he didn't think he was right. One bit for World War II vets to have to be called up. So that's why he enlisted. Because if the country needed help that bad, he was going to step up. And if he's there, that's one more person that maybe did not need to be called back up from active service that have already sacrificed so much. It's wild. That's where he lost his hearing, by the way. He was a forward observer. One of the most dangerous positions out there. He didn't talk about it much, but he was a proud, proud Marine. Carl and Jaylene had two children, Connie and Ricky. Both the children were born with special needs. Connie only lived a couple months. Ricky lived until he was 40 years old. Ricky's life was made so much more joyful and joyous because Carl made sure that that was the case. Carl poured so much energy into making sure Ricky had everything he needed and wanted, which included getting him a jukebox, by the way, I think, because Ricky liked music so much. It meant going to Special Olympics year after year. And I spoke with several family members and friends these last several weeks, and all of them mentioned the care that Ricky received. Carl lived for his son. We heard from Richard, Carl's brother, earlier. The roles were pretty reversed these last several months with you caring for Carl. And I know he valued you being there and the conversations that you had. He told me so. And Linda, Richard's wife, certainly did not feel like the in-law in this situation. She was treated and felt like another sister to Carl. That's because Carl made that possible. Linda calls Carl their matchmaker because it was through them that Carl or that, that Richard and Linda got, got together. She said something that I thought was spot on. She said, and I quote, Carl was always looking for something pleasant, hopeful, and joyful. And that's certainly my impression of Carl as well as his pastor. He brought in Carolyn, Jaylene's sister, to live with them for a bit. Carolyn needed support and needed to be around family because of what she was going through. He didn't do that because it was the nice thing to do or even the right thing to do. <clears throat> it's because he lived for others. You should hear um, Joy that we heard from earlier, uh, like Carl's niece, talk about Carl. She said something in here also that I'm going to repeat. Um, when you live for someone else, again, you become a beacon of light and love. That's exactly how Joy experienced her uncle Carl. She said, Carl made you feel like the most important person in this life. She said it earlier. I'll say it again. She said she felt safe and loved when she was around him. And I asked you know, because I like to probe questions. How, how did he make you feel like that? She said, it's simply who he was. He was at every major event in her life. Carl lived for the sake of others. He had a special relationship with Carol Ogden. In fact, that's why he was even at this church. 
because of the connection he had with Carol. Every time I would mention Carol to him, he would say, Carol Ann, she's amazing. She's wonderful. (laughs) Carol, I knew. I know you loved him deeply. But he loved you so much as well. When Carl was facing terminal diagnosis and a lack of mobility and significantly altering his way of life, all he could ask me about was how Carol was doing because of everything that Carol was going through. Excuse me. And Carl had a special relationship with Nick, Carol's son. Nick didn't always make it easy for you to get to know him, but Carl broke through that no problem. Carl would take Nick to many doctor's visits, and, and they would always go out for liver and onions afterwards. He was not doing that for himself. He was living for Carol and for Nick. His living for others didn't stop when people passed away. You see, Jaylene loved her plants, loved them. Carl kept them going for many years after Jaylene passed. I don't think he knew how to stop moving, by the way. His work ethic had him out there 80 plus hours a week, sometimes with three and four jobs in his life. He didn't know how to relax and take time for himself. So even after retirement, he found ways to live for others, volunteered for Meals on Wheels, volunteered for Family Promise. That's our homeless ministry here at church. He came out to every single work day the church had. And when he couldn't get out anymore, he would call me and ask if he could donate supplies that we needed for work days and such. His involvement at church, I thought, was extravagant. But that was before I really got to know him and find out that's simply how he lived his life. Church involvement was so very important to him, but he took service to a whole new level. When people were in need in the church, Carl made sure they got a little extra. No one knew that but me. He was so generous with his time and his finances. And when he first started at the church, he wanted to go to our potlucks, but he didn't want to just buy something and bring it. So he called up Linda's uh, and, and, and had her walk him through recipes. Not for himself, not for himself. Again, he wanted to bring something to the potluck for others. You know, he gave, this is wild, he gave my family a car. Lauren, my middle daughter, was turning 16, and we didn't have money for a car for her. So he came by the church one day, just randomly, and he goes, hey man, I've got two cars, I'm going to give you one. He goes, I only need one. You can have this one. I go, Carl, let's, let's not get crazy here, all right? And he said, does she need a car? And I go, well, yes. And he goes, do you have one to give her? And I go, no. And he goes, then here you go, <laughs> living for the sake of others. His neighbor, Mary, shared with me a story that completely captures how Carl looked at the world. His dog, Bo, had passed away. And he was ready for another dog. So Mary took him all over town and was looking for rescue dogs or dogs from the pound or something like that. But this was during the COVID lockdowns. And so all the dogs were in foster homes. Carl was not going to be swayed. They noticed a flyer for a three-legged dog, three-legged rescue dog. Carl said, and I quote, no one else will want this dog. So she's the dog for me. Is there a better story or a better example that shows us how Carl's mind works, what his world outlook was, and how he lived his life? You would think that living in such a self-sacrificing way would be hard and taxing. But just a few months ago, I was over at Carl's. And I asked him what he thinks about everything. Of course, he was facing lots of things at that point. He'd just been diagnosed with terminal cancer and didn't have much longer to live. And he said, I've led such a good life. He said, I've, I've, I've had such a wonderful life. I have no complaints. Other people have it so much worse than me. This is a guy who buried two children lost his hearing in a war that he enlisted in because he didn't want others to have to go. Endured the passing of his wife of 62 years 
and had serious health issues at the end. Was just diagnosed with cancer, thus putting a timetable on his life. And he says, I have had a wonderful life. You can make an argument that he was just being humble or disingenuous or trying to see his cup as half full even when there was barely anything in that cup. But you would be wrong. I mean, I was Carl's pastor. I knew him well. We went to lunch countless times. He would stop by the church and visit time after time. I can tell you with great certainty that Carl was content. He was at peace. And he experienced the joy that very few people get to experience. Because that's what happens when you live for others. The contentment from God. The presence of Jesus. Experiencing the divine, whatever you want to call it, Carl had it. When you live for the sake of others, you will experience life as well. Doing for others takes its toll, and it can be exhausting, but shifting to living for others is not just another chore. It brings contentment like no other. Carl got to experience the joy that comes from above. He truly embodied the idea that you get way more than you give. If he was standing here right now, he would say that he was the one who was blessed. And friends, he wouldn't be wrong. He tapped into the mystery and lived its benefits fully. When I think of Jesus' teachings lived out, I will forever think of Carl. Thanks be to God from my friend, Carl Modenbach. After this next song, we will have a presentation from the Sky Took VFW. There will be a 21 gun salute and there'll be a flag presentation following.
you've never seen our flag folded. You notice that there's 13 triangular folds. Each fold has a reason. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. The third fold is an honor and remembrance of all of our departed families. The fourth fold is a trust in God's guidance. The fifth fold is a duty to our country. The sixth fold is our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The seventh fold is a tribute to all of our armed forces. The eighth fold is a tribute to this, our departed family. The ninth fold is a tribute to all of our mothers. The tenth fold is a tribute to all of our fathers. The eleventh fold glorifies in the Hebrew lives of our labor and rising continue. Well, Paul represents God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The thirteenth fold is the completed fold. The stars are up above, reminding us of our national motto: "In God We Trust." Let us now take courage. 
that God is our eternal friend and companion. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds this day, now and forevermore. And the one we call the Christ, the Savior, and the risen Lord. Amen.